Hi, and welcome to Dungeons and Tangents. I'm Robert Sherman. And I'm Eric Dewhurst. Today we were talking about a topic that we always do, but first we want to tell you about um, some news that we have. One, we have a website now, dungeonsandtangents.net, where you can find uh, links to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and RSS feed, things like that. And our subject for today is preparing an adventure, and this is more geared towards people running the game as opposed to playing the game. Uh, we're going to start differentiating our episodes by those that are targeted toward DMs versus players, or a general audience. Uh, and this one is specific to Dungeon Masters. So if that's not something that interests you, then you know right now to just go ahead and uh, move on to something else if you yeah. want to. Um, and there's different kinds of prep that you want to do depending on what kind of game you're going to run. Uh, Eric and I talked about it, and it became pretty apparent pretty quickly that the kind of prep you can do can be wildly different if you're doing a pre-built game, like the one they might just buy off the shelf, or a game that you're doing your own, a homebrew game, right? So you might already have maps, um, you know, flavor text for a pre-built game. For homebrew, you have to come up with a lot of that for yourself. Uh, but there's also a lot of prep that you would do that applies to both. Yeah. And the first item that came to mind regarding what you, what's really applicable to any game of D&D is something that I've just started trying, which is casting the NPCs. Casting meaning identifying an actor or a person. It could be somebody you know in real life, but saying, you know, Dornan is going to be played by Humphrey Bogart because Dornan is a owner of a bar and he's very cutthroat and he to me, sounds a lot like Humphrey Bogart from Casablanca. So if I go into a game knowing that, it helps me build out the character. And it also helps me uh, convey to the players what that character is like. And if I just tell them straight out, hey, uh, Dornan is going to be played by Humphrey Bogart, and think Humphrey Bogart from Casablanca, then the players can fill in the blanks and... It, it expands the the nature of that character beyond my ability to be an actor during that session or my ability to communicate subtleties about that character. Mm -hmm. It also very effectively instantly syncs up everybody's perception of that character, right? Yeah. Which can be very important. As well as how that character is represented physically. Yeah. Like a manager. Just right. it straight into that. Did you see that? That was amazing. <laughs> um, so one of the things we do for prep, depending on what kind of game you want to run, would be miniatures. And we've talked about miniatures at length. Um, but, you know, do you have the miniatures that you want? You may not even know what miniatures you want. A big part of that is determining what is going to be overall in your overarching campaign. You're going to start with your, your key players, like your, you know, your players, your PCs, your key NPCs, stuff like that. Um, and then there's also, you know, the usual suspects, right? Goblins, skeletons, wolves, stuff you're going to always need. Yeah. Um, but if you think that you can want something special, um, you may want to keep an eye out, or you may want to actually actively go and look for something specific to this. And then, if, if nothing else, that way you'll know beforehand if you can't find something specific to that. I most recently have started running uh, The Sunless Citadel, but, and when I started running it, I ran through, I flipped through the whole thing, and I identified every place that it said creature, and I wrote down what creatures, and then I went through my inventory of miniatures, and I figured out, oh, these are the ones I don't don't have. Um, maybe somebody who's gonna come to the game already has one of those, or I'm gonna have to go buy some. And mm -hmm. I just made a shopping list based on what was gonna be in the campaign. And then some uh, related to that would be props, right? Yeah, uh, I haven't seen a lot of props used in games. I enjoy bringing things into a game that aren't things people would have thought of before. I built you know, a structure for uh, the first session of the Summer Citadel, and I'll probably build things in the future as well. And that, that's, that takes a lot of time and effort, uh, and it's almost always absolutely unnecessary. It's just- That was awesome. <laughs> I, I really liked it. It's, I was grin, ear to ear grin as soon as he pulled it out and put it on the table. I love, making the game tactile. So props and structures really help me to get engaged as a DM in being able to convey the sense of scale is really, mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to building structures that 
are miniature scale. That helps me convey the, the scale of, of the setting. At one point, I was going to have a, a little bell used for uh, a magic spell, and whoever had it could cast the spell. Uh, that never got used in the campaign, but that's those sort of props. It's something that's possible. It's something that you can tie in real world props into the game if you really want to. But I don't know, have you seen many other props? Um, not as well as you've done. Like when we, we used the, the dice box as the cart, you know? Oh, yeah. That's probably a pretty common one. Uh, it's also nice because you don't have to redraw the cart every time, you just move it around. <laughs> um, I have the, the bridge that Len got me. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I don't know if I'll ever use it, but I've got it right, right next to my minis, and every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, I'm going to use that someday. There's, I mean, there's a scale, right, of a spectrum of like something that you just kind of throw together, like that dice box or something like that bridge that's like really well done, and, and obviously that's a bridge, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I like all of them. I think that the more you get to one side of the scale, like it, it becomes more specific, and you have to use it for a certain thing, but regardless... I don't feel like you have to get to that point. It's really cool to have that, right? Yeah. I, I sleep better at night knowing I've got that bridge <laughs> if, if I ever need it. But don't let it stop you from using props. That's what you want to do because yeah. it is really cool for your players. Um, when Eric pulled out the the, the switchback that was going to lead down into the side of the Citadel, that was like a really cool moment for me. Um, I was immediately that you know just a little bit more engaged, a little more attentive, and, uh, and everybody, again, it synced everybody up like knowing what we had to do to get down on there. There were no misconceptions about like which part of the switchback was up and down, right? Like it was yeah. obviously everybody understood what was going on there. Uh, and we got to mimic the little goblin falling off and, you know, right. <laughs> so it was fun. The next thing that every campaign has is reference material. Um, and that, that reference material can be in all sorts of different formats. It could be a piece of paper, it can be uh, an Evernote file or a OneNote file or just a text file on a computer. There are lot, so many different kinds of notes that you can take during a campaign, but I feel like I've finally broken it down into some kind of specifics. One is I need to build encounters. If I know they're going to be you know, five encounters over the next two sessions, I'm going to build those encounters. And I personally use uh, an app called Game Master. I think it's amazing. Um, it allows me to enter in characters, NPCs, monsters, have all their stats in there, uh, roll initiative, keep track of initiative, and hit points and conditions. It does everything I need, need it to do. So when I'm preparing for a game, regardless of whether it's pre-written or, or my own, I'm entering all of the encounters in that usually like a week ahead of time I have all the encounters set up and then I'm tweaking them if I need to if there's some change of the story or there's some reason to to change them and I can change them on the fly during the game as well if you know I loaded three skeletons and it's obvious that the group is just going to tear through three skeletons I'll throw two more in hmm. I I came up with this you and I apparently came up with this independently the concept of a pronunciation guide yeah I thought that was very interesting that we, we were just talking about well how do you prep and we hadn't really discussed it before but we both had a pronunciation guide on there and it was something that I had done for a completely different game Eric had done I have a problem with um, and I've done this since I was a kid I will say something a certain way in my head and I, I would read more than I would talk to other people as a kid and so I'd have basic words that I wouldn't pronounced properly, right? Yeah. Um, like archive, I was convinced as a kid was pronounced archive, right? Because oh, that's yeah, how I read it. Yeah. So it's so like that. Um, but then there's stuff that is, you know, open to interpretation, like character names or region names or towns, right? And it doesn't matter how you say it really, but it's nice if you say it the same time every time or the same way every time. Yeah. I had a, a trouble uh, over the last two sessions. I said one character's name two different ways. And now the players are confused. Mm -hmm. And some some of those like town names, if you say them differently, they, they sound like a completely different name. Right? Yeah, yeah. And some of them just kind of takes away from the impact of it. Like one thing um, for me is like listening to some podcasts like that. If you listen to anything relating to Ravenloft, right? 
you may hear the main antagonist pronounced in many different ways. The two main ones be like uh, could be Strad or Strahd, right? Yeah. And both are fine, but that, I think that's a really good example because in that campaign, whenever you hear that name, it should have weight to it, an impact to it because right. it's very ominous, right? Um, when you hear that name, you shouldn't be like, oh, didn't you say it differently the last time you said it? <laughs> yeah. That's going to take away from it a little bit, yeah. right? It's, it, make, it makes you take it less seriously. So just having something there where you know, it's spelled out phonetically, this is the way I say it every single time. And it sounds simple because, well, it doesn't matter how other people say it, it's the way I say it. The way you say it and you start hearing other people say it, I'm assuming other people have this issue because I know I have it. It'll start to just get in my head and affect the way that I say it in the future. And then I'll start to go just go back and forth. And I have yeah. no, cons- no consistency whatsoever. And my problem is, is exactly the same thing. I'll get a pronunciation in my head and I almost, I almost have to just sit down go through, and I did this actually with Son of the Citadel, write down every name that, that I'm going to be saying out loud, and then write it down phonetically, and then say it out loud. And say it out loud as many or more times than I've said it in my head mm-hmm. to get myself over however I was saying it wrong and into knowing how to say it. It's kind of like acting prep. You, you want to practice your lines a little bit. Yeah. I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do that well enough with uh, the first two sessions of Summa Citadel, and I pronounced the uh, what well, Yisidril. Oh yeah. I think I was pronouncing it Yisidril, and it's Yisdril. I like flipped a couple. Um, had a reversal of a couple of the syllables. Even if you write it out, because I I do this a lot, and I'll just be like I just I'm in my own head a lot, and so I'll write it out like that's gonna be a problem. I'm gonna say it. The wrong way, right? Because I'm saying it in my head the wrong way, or, or different ways, however you want to look at it. Um, and then I'll write it out in a presentation guide, but I won't actually say it. It actually mm-hmm. helps to actually say it and yeah. kind of get it into your head of like, and then hear it coming out of your own mouth. That like that's what it sounds like. That's how I say it. Yeah, because um, you're either going to go through that that learning process before the game or during the game. Exactly. If you go through it during the game, then the players are going to see your learning process and they're going to feel like you're not quite in control of uh, the situation. You know, when it's just a fun, friendly game, usually that's fine. But if you are hoping to kind of impress them with the world that's being created, then the more certain you are of things, the more believable the, the world is. All right, so we're talking about pre-built campaigns now. Uh, there's a lot out there, a lot of them are great. Um, with the new stuff like the, the DMs Guild, you know, Drive Through RPG, there's a lot of peop- there's a lot more options for people to kind of self-publish. So you have a lot of uh, a lot of things to choose from. At kind of first blush, it feels it sounds a lot easier. Well, it's built, it's pre-built, it's good. That's all there is to it, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it brings its own difficulties to it that you and I have both experienced. Yeah, I should point out that I've been talking about running the Sentinel Citadel. This is the first time I've run a pre-built campaign. I've run two, maybe three, I think maybe two homemade campaigns before, those felt significantly easier to me. Well, I say that, except I probably put more effort into them. <laughs> they mm-hmm. just felt easier because they felt natural. Whereas a pre bell campaign, I have to learn this new reality. So for me, that starts with reading it front to back. I don't want to miss some key plot point that's hidden in uh, one room. And it, I, I guess I should say, if this is if, if you're a new DM and you've never seen a pre-built campaign before, they essentially are, um, they'll describe kind of the general, what, what the conflict is. The if general, you're lucky. So yeah, if you're lucky, they, they describe the, the general conflict uh, and give you some hooks, hooks being the reasons why the characters want to be involved in resolving the conflict. And then they'll go room by room or, or area by area, describe the area, tell you what's there. Monsters, treasure, motivations at sometimes of the characters that are in a particular area. Interspersed in these areas, um, it could be a hundred different rooms in a dungeon, you'll have lots of different characters with different motivations and you learn through reading this that there's a story underneath it. And there might be multiple stories. In the Sunless Citadel, 
there are layers of history that you learn by reading it all the way through. And if you didn't read it all the way through, if you just read like the first three pages and tried to start running the campaign, you could do it. You could get away with it, but you're going to miss a lot of subtlety, um, which is fine. If you, uh, I was just watching Matthew Colville, who did a video uh, about the same subject last week. Mm -hmm. He said he just reads just far enough to deal with the first session. He's very experienced. He's done this dozens and dozens of times before. He knows the scope of what that first session is going to be. I didn't know what the scope of our first session was going to be, and I was wrong when I guessed at what the scope of our first session was going to be. It, you guys got much further than I expected. And I'd read through the whole module twice, and I got some amount of detail into my brain. And that was really, like, the reading process is to get as much into my brain as possible so that I don't have to look at the notes. I went into the module and I started writing, here's who I've cast for each NPC. Um, and then you guys didn't talk to any of those NPCs, <laughs> so I didn't tell you that Max von Sindow and I think uh, uh, Grace Jones and some other crazy actors from the uh, 80s were, were in the village. I missed out. <laughs> and to, to, to touch on that episode from Matthew Colville, <clears throat> it, it makes it very, it really kind of helps emphasize that there's, there's different ways to do it. There's not one right way to do it and one wrong way to do it, right? Even between the two of us, we have some different definite mm -hmm. things that we do differently. Like, I did something very similar to what you did for Lost Man of Delver, where I tried to read as much as possible, commit as much as possible to memory, and what I ended up doing is reading through as much as I could and then retaining almost nothing. <laughs> I, and instead yeah. of just kind of going through and getting the really just kind of skeletal structure of what was happening, the best thing that you can do for people uh, adventure, unless you're doing something like Adventurous League or something, and even then, I think it's a good thing to do is just make it your own. Yeah. Um, do what you need to make it your own because you're going to run it a lot better than, than if you're just if you're trying to just kind of recite, you know, everything just wrote. You know, it's it's not going to work out well. And you, at least for me, I'm not even going to listen to what I'm saying. And then by the time I'm done, they're going to know what I said. But then I know what I said, which is a big trap for me that I've, I've kind of learned to uh, to avoid. And it doesn't mean don't prep or don't read up or anything like that, but just don't feel obligated or chained to that content verbatim. It's okay to go yeah. off script, right? Um, and it's even helpful sometimes. The more I've prepped, the more off script I go. Like the more comfortable I feel, the more I'm not looking at the notes. Mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, you walk into a room and I describe the room. I don't read you the description of the room. Every time that you guys get to the end of where I'm prepped, I start flipping to the book more and I start reading verbatim to you guys. Mm -hmm. I don't know this area well enough to know what the structure is, what the motivations of the characters are, what how it ties into the bigger picture, which I really should know before you guys hit a particular area. And then I get scared about, like, you're going to miss something important, so I better read this verbatim and sit here and get prepared now like commit the overarching structure and how this fits into the overarching structure to my brain right now which is a horrible thing to do <laughs> I, I i feel like it makes the game less fun for the person writing it yeah and it makes it feel kind of stilted to the people mm -hmm. who were playing it right you get here that like modify areas or plot and that i think that's a yeah. big part of making it your own I mean, I'll admit I am in the process of learning how to run a campaign uh, that's been written by somebody else. I'm starting to realize that the key to it is is making it my own and making it my own by effectively treating it like a homemade campaign that I just didn't come up with the structure mm -hmm. rather than treating it like I am trying to paint a replica of a picture on the fly while you guys are watching me. That's that's kind of what it feels like when I'm trying to yeah, absolutely. do it. And that's not necessary. What's necessary is that I've got a map and I've got kind of an overarching plot and I've got some NPCs and some bad guys and some good guys and, and I know how they're all gonna kind of function together. And hopefully I've got some interesting encounters that I understand well enough to, to play off of the players. If I have just the big picture items in my head, 
I can fill in the blanks and you guys can mm-hmm. help me fill in the blanks. If I'm staring at the specific words that this particular room is telling me I should be reading, then I'm, I am too lost in the, in the forest. Right. And it, it impacts that perception and that engagement. And we talked about this in a different episode of like starting to feel the boundaries of the game. Mm-hmm. Right. If yeah. we do something and you start going, like, well, hold on, and you start looking and you start reading it out, I immediately start to feel the boundaries of the game. It yeah. doesn't feel really, it becomes very two dimensional immediately, right? Yep. And whereas if you're just like, yeah, and then this happened and this happened, well, that means you're going to do this, you know, and, I, and, it, and it feels like it's just happening on the fly. It, it really kind of brings me in. And I, I don't feel like, you know, I'm going to hit a wall anywhere, right? Right. The thing that I've struggled with a lot, and I think maybe a lot of people do, I think a lot of people don't, cause, and, and they're just really good at it, or they're really good at hiding it. But what I've struggled with a lot is feeling obligated to just stick to that path and stick to that material. And the truth is, you're not obligated to do that, and really, you shouldn't do that at yeah. all. And I'm going to say, make up my own. I don't just mean like, you know, just kind of, you know, reword things or put different cover text in there. Like, you can completely just go off script yeah. and do something and change things that you know, are very important to that module, your players, for the most part, aren't going to know because they haven't read it. Right. So if you're making it fun and it's still engaging, you're, you're doing you're doing great, right? And, the you know, and you might be like, well, what if they have read it? What if they played it before, right? <laughs> well, just think about it. If they've read the module or they've played it and they know what to expect, is it more fun for them to be right at what to expect or is it more fun for them to be like, oh, I didn't. That, that's. I wasn't prepared for that. That's not what happens in the module. Like, yeah. All of a sudden, they're not playing a module. They're playing a, you know, you know, a real, you know, imaginary world that you put together. Like, they don't know what to expect anymore. And then it's not just following a script. It's them actually interacting with the game and playing yeah. the game. Right? That they're no longer watching a movie. They're a part of the movie. Exactly. Uh, um, so the worst thing that's going to happen is that your players are going to have fun. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that's okay. At the end of the day, that's what you're there to do. And that comes into something else that you're going to encounter most probably if you play a, a pre-built adventure that's in any kind of an established campaign setting. Mm-hmm. One of the most popular ones out there and one of the biggest one, most you know, in-depth ones is going to be the Forgotten Realms. A lot of people played in it, a lot of people know it. And you're going to you're gonna run into something almost unavoidable, something called, uh, I call, uh, canon expertise, right? Where oh, yes. You're going to run into something where Let's say Forgotten Realms is a great example. There's a lot of uh, mythology, lore, there's a lot of established canon. You're going to have a player who knows more about certain parts than you do. It doesn't mean you're not a good DM. It doesn't mean that you don't enjoy that setting. It doesn't mean anything negative. It's just going to happen. But really, they know more about the established canon of that campaign setting. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they know more about what you, the game that you're running. It's not just an established campaign setting. It's a very established timeline. So you could maybe that you're in a different part of that timeline where you know these characters aren't around or this geography has changed or anything like that. And also, it's okay to be like, okay, I take this and I use it. You know, this is inspired by the game that we're playing, but this is not the game we're playing. Right. Um, and it, and it's okay for to for it to be the game they're playing. There's no more. It, it depends on the player. It depends on how much they want to try and push that or inject that expertise into it. Right. Um, it, it may be a non-issue, but. It's okay to not be intimidated by that. To just let it go. You can't help it. It's going to happen. It happens to everybody. Um, it's not a big deal. So I am a very inexperienced DM when it comes to canon. I know I've never read any... Well, okay, I've read like 30 pages of one of the Dragonlance books, uh, which isn't in Forgotten Realms, is it? No, it's not. No, it's in Kryn, right? Correct. Okay. My exposure to the Forgotten Realms is like... Uh, I played Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights... Those two games, and I just assumed that the things that happened in that were canon to those video games, and that's all. And I didn't realize until later that maybe some of it is canon to the overarching um, Forgotten Realms timelines. What I know is the geography, and that's about it. I don't know any characters. I know, I know monsters. You know. Everybody knows what dragons are. <laughs> That's more than enough. I think the biggest thing you can get from a campaign setting isn't the characters, it isn't this, it isn't, you know, it's not the different weapons that are being used. It's an overall feel. Those, All of those things are important in creating that overall feel of that campaign setting. 
Dragonlance. Well, there's, there's dragons. Yeah, that's that's a huge part of it, but that's not all of it, right? I mean, there's it has a, a, a sense of gravity and extended like legacy to it that it's everything that's happening uh, is happening across the entire campaign at once, right? The, the whole campaign is at war. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's okay. a result of multiple things that have been happening for thousands of years ever since the cataclysm, right? Uh, the gods are involved, you know, and, mm-hmm. and they're heading towards a, a climax in that plot together, not like a bunch of, like every single book is like, you know, its own story, you know, because a lot of them actually are like sub-stories, but they're all part of that one kind of overall plot that's heading in the same direction, right? Whereas mm-hmm. Forgotten Realms, things are going in all kinds of different directions, right? Okay. Um, R- Ravenloft, things are you know, happening in you know, different directions, but the same almost like rules or mechanics are applied in that it's a it's a domain or different domains that dark lords have reference to, but they're all damned, and everybody basically always loses. But you know, it's 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 a recurring kind of theme, almost kind of you know, Twilight Zone ish. Uh, there's that feeling to it, and that's what you really get from me from a campaign is that word. You don't need to be an expert in everything that's ever happened or every character or every NPC or every event just to be able to embrace that this is the feeling I'm going for. This is the yeah. campaign I'll use. I think that's very effective. That's a huge part of the value they bring to it. And so I don't have to be an expert. And to me, I don't even know uh, enough about each of the campaign settings to know what you know, just, just what you said. What I know is there's a map I don't need to build a map now. <laughs> <laughs> and it can be that simple too. Absolutely. And yeah. Uh, we, can, we can transition there into homebrew, I think. We can. The, the one last thing I was going to oh, right. say is a, a very powerful technique for me for preparing games that are pre-built is just watching actual play podcasts, listening to them, or other people running through it. It's an incredibly effective way to get a kind of a crash course. You can do it. You can have it like listening in the back, you know, background noise in the car on a road trip or something. But it, it is a very effective, effective way to consume that. And also, if you listen to even just two uh, podcasts for the same adventure module, you'll immediately see a lot of the points that we're talking about in that they'll they can be run very differently. Yeah. Right, with very different results. I could be like, well, that wasn't part of this. That wasn't part of that. Right. Uh, doesn't make them any one not less than the other. One's not better than the other. They're just different. Well, me coming from music, it's kind of like listening to the original version of a song, and then one band's cover and another band's cover. And now you've got three different perspectives on a song, and if you want to do your own cover, you're going to take the parts of all three of them that you like the best and mm-hmm. and make them yours. So now we can transition into absolutely uh, homebrew. Have you ever run a campaign from scratch? I don't. I don't think so. Okay, and for me, it just felt natural to go straight to that. I was insane when I first started because I had never DM'd at all before, and I started with well, like I played Baldur's Gate, I played Neverwinter Nights. I'll use that map, and then I thought, okay, I'm going to need to have conflict, and that because conflict is the, the center of any story. It's true of pre-written campaigns. It's true of uh, a homebrew campaign, you need to find bad things that are happening for your pl- players to be able to come in and do good. I mean, that, that's assuming that your players want to be do-gooders. Right. Um, Varies. Yeah. <laughs> but either way, whether they're playing good players or bad players, they're going to need conflict. And if they don't have conflict, it's going to be a boring, boring game. That's where I started was, well, where's the conflict going to come from? And then I had to build all of the political structure within my own mind. And I, I used um, Obsidian Portal to build a giant wiki of every character, how they were interrelated with other characters, um, and essentially building a, a small cast of characters. I didn't, I didn't do any of the NPC casting at the time, but I probably should have. Um, building this cast of characters that are the key players in the conflict. In that first campaign that I built, I went so far as to tie it all the way up to the gods. So I had an overarching demon god uh, that was influencing people underneath him, and those people were connected with uh, people underneath them. I was building it kind of like 
your standard um, role-playing game video game uh, where you've got your low-level mooks that you're going to take out and then you move up the ranks slowly right. until you get to the big boss. I overplanned though. I just overplanned way beyond what I needed to do. That is like, I was planning for what would probably be a two-year campaign and we played six sessions. It sounds almost <laughs> like you, you planned for the last session and then just reverse engineered it from yes. there. Yeah, I, I did. And that, that is in stark contrast to the second set of campaigns that I did, the, the flex campaigns where I wanted conflict now. <laughs> I wanted you guys to deal with it in one session and go from learning about the conflict to resolving the conflict in like a three or four hour session. I still needed to figure out who are the key players, what's the conflict, how are the players motivated to get connected to them. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like writing a story. When you write a story of any sort, you need to know who is there, what's the inciting incident, how can it be resolved. In writing D&D, it's a little bit different than writing a story is a story or a play has three acts. You have the exposition at the beginning where you say, here are the people, here's the problem. And then you have <clears throat> the central act where you expound upon it a little bit. Uh, you give uh, more depth to the characters. You see the conflict in progress. And then the third act is always, here's how you resolve a conflict. In D&D, &D, you don't want to write the third act as a DM. I should never be telling you, the players, how to resolve a conflict. I might uh, have thoughts in my mind about how it could happen, and I might leave doors open, but I really should never tell you, here's how the third act goes. I should be writing the first act, and maybe a little bit of the second act. Tell you who's, who's there, what's the, uh, what's the conflict, um, why do you care about the characters and the conflict, and then go to town and start interacting with the conflict. <laughs> it's, it's a very uh, kind of abstract approach to d and I'm not thinking about it in terms of, um, well, I need monsters. Which monsters am I going to use? I, I want to think about uh, what kind of conflict are they going to have? Is it going to be somebody that is trying to take over an area and you have to stop that person from taking over an area. Or maybe it's somebody who's trying to kidnap someone and you need to stop the kidnapper. Or you need to go find some great artifact that is going to cure a horrible plague. On top of that, I'm gonna put layers of conflict to stop you from being able to achieve whatever that is. I think it was a second or third campaign in the flex sessions. Uh, you guys were going to an archive. Mm -hmm. Your objective was to retrieve something. It was a fetch quest. Go fetch this thing for me, please. And that, that's such a straightforward quest. I mean, it's it's there's fetch quest, kill quest, and is there anything else? Escort. Escort. Fetch, escort, kill. That's that's kind of the, the main three. Some, yeah. Once you know that those are the three main things, it's hard to not see everything as one of those. But you can put them in a nice dressing and make them feel less less generic. So you are doing a fetch quest. Go bring me the thing. But you get there. Somebody's already been to this place that's been abandoned for 100, 200, 300 years. The door's already open, effectively. You show up, door's open. What's going on? You walk in the door. You find somebody dead. What's going on? Mm -hmm. Adding that second layer means that there's something else going on and there's a mystery now. It adds depth and believability because the world isn't as straightforward as go get me a thing. Okay, I'm going to go get you a thing. When the world is that simple, it, it's boring. So you've got to put all those, those obstacles in the way. After our last session that we played, I went home and I was putting some things away. And I actually found the binder that I had used, not running the game, but playing in a game that my old DM had played. He had put together a bunch of different lore and all that. And I, I had a binder full of stuff that were just notes that he'd written out. Uh, all the way up from you know, the gods to some mm. local you know, politics and all that. Uh, there were maps in there that were done. Session notes that we had typed out. He had actually set up a, a, a wiki for it before there was Obsidian Portal. You know, uh, I came across something that uh, really kind of made me chuckle because I'd forgotten about it. It was, um, it, was, it was two emails. It was one email that he sent out to the group. 
here's some bonus XP that you can get. Here's some goals that you can the party can get, right? It would it escalate. It would be like, you know, save this person, you know, 200 XP, all that. All the way to take over a kingdom for a million experience. You know, right? <laughs> it was, it was uh, just this list of goals that would get more and more complicated and more and more involved. Uh, but then there was a second email, and it was just, just to me, and it was just for my character, and it was a, a subset of goals that were just for him. There would be experience that only he would receive if I achieved his goals. So the same thing would escalate and all that, but there were goals that were very specific to my character, right? Uh, I was running a ranger, so it was, uh, I think my favorite enemy was undead. So there were some undead specific goals in there, like that, but then there were some other goals in there, things like that. But everybody got one of those, right? Which was really cool because it engaged us. We all had our own kind of motives and all that. Yeah. In addition to the other motives that we had, so it wasn't just whatever adventure we were currently on. We were always looking for opportunities. Like, well, what's on my list? Can I? What about that? Is there <laughs> any of these around? Are there any skeletons around? You know, because that's like I could check it off my list. But then it was two or three sessions in. It became very obvious that our lists were kind of seated with goals that weren't in sync with the other players' goals. There were some goals that contradicted each other, and it made some very interesting kind of dynamics because one of the conditions was we would get none of the XP if we told the other players what our goals were. Oh, okay. It would completely invalidate the list. <laughs> so we couldn't share, right? We, we, we knew the group goals, but we didn't know our individual yeah. goals. And some of those goals put us in direct conflict with other goals for other players. Uh, and we would start to, like, we slowly started to discover, like, oh, he's like... We don't just have party versus world conflict. We have some, you know, inter-party conflict as well as far as like... Do you still have this? I've got the list for me. I have the list for everybody else. Well, that's fine. um, But it was was this really cool moment of like, oh, it's not just this binary us versus them. Like, you know, in a real situation, there would be, you know, you know, inter-party politics as well. And it, it was just a moment like, oh, well, yeah you know what, you might not want the same things I want. Uh, and normally we just gloss over that because, you know, kill, XP, level, repeat. Right. But now we have this thing that really solidified, like, well, no, we all have our own personalities, we all have our own goals, we have our own plans, and they're not always going to align. That's brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. And uh, He's going to love that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's brilliant for a very key reason. I mean, I was just talking about conflict. Conflict is the center of every story. If you don't have conflict, again, a fetch quest without a, a, an obstacle is nothing, is, is not a story. Conflict that is us versus them is very uh, arm's length. Yes. You can, you can think about it as, eh, it's them. I don't have to deal with, with it after I go to bed. They'll be there tomorrow, whatever. When it's protagonist versus protagonist... Everybody's really engaged, far yes. more engaged than you could be uh, before. Uh, I was actually having a discussion with Lynn, uh, my wife, about this. We watched the first season of the show Grimm, which is uh, was filmed here in Portland. We watched the first season, and I was like, ah, it's, it's an okay episode, or okay show. It's not really hooking me much. I guess we'll start watching the second season. We start watching the second season, and I'm like, why is this so much better? And it was because the main characters were not a part of the conflict in the first season. Mm -hmm. They were dealing with conflict, just like in D&D. They would uh, resolve whatever issue other people were having, and then they'd move on to deal with more people that have issues that are not them. As soon as the second season came around, clearly the writers thought, you know what, We we can throw our characters in the middle of this ring and have them in conflict with one another and the world around them. And as soon as that happened, it was so much more engaging. I was like, I care about this character because now they're in peril. There's risk in their lives now. They're not just problem solvers that are sitting there on a a conveyor belt fixing the next problem that comes along. And that's what your DM did. Mm -hmm. You say, you're no longer just the CSI team that goes in, fixes stuff, leaves now you're in conflict with one another and uh you're having those um soap opera moments <laughs> and it made our characters feel more real too in that it it helped add weight to the backstories made all that solidify it just 
it, it didn't break the game. It didn't mean we didn't dissolve the conflict. It just it made everything feel that much more realistic, right? And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not just carbon copies with different classes, you know, and attributes on our sheets. We we all have different motivations. It was, it was a dimension that had been added to to the game that I had never experienced before, mm -hmm. and it it changed things for me and, and and how I would interact with other party members. And he always ran the game like that, and it was always <laughs> this, this incredibly satisfying, engaging, and just like. Went to the next session. Yeah, you know, it was just like we, it was we were, we were always ready to just, just drop anything and come and play. Like it was, <laughs> um, and it was one of the the most consistent, longest running uh, group of people I've played with, you know, in my adult life. Like we all, we all we always came back. We always did that. We had some people who, who would kind of drop in and out, right? Uh, like some pickup members like that. That you know, that, you know, they don't always work out. But we we played for years. He ran this. From scratch, it was not a. Uh, if he didn't, he did a really good job making me think he did. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure he did. Ken, some, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but yeah, his his campaign was from scratch that he had done, and he I don't know how many hours he, he spent <laughs> doing that, but uh, and I'm, I'm I'm sure Kirsten helps, but it was this amazing world that he just kind of brought us into, and uh, it was so much fun. Inspiration. Mm -hmm. When you're writing your own stuff. Nothing comes from nothing. You can't invent things. So it's, I think it's really important to, to go out and find something that's going to inspire you to run a campaign. Um, whether it's a, a piece of writing, for instance, that first campaign I wrote was based on H.P. Lovecraft's work, and that built the political structure to me. You know, it was like Cthulhu-like god at the top with your stereotypical um, cult somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. and normal people at the bottom getting squished. Inspiration isn't just story, it's also images and maps and uh, actors. And I use Pinterest quite a bit just for, for visuals. I, I haven't used it in a while because I haven't run homebrew campaign in a while, but for homebrew, to me, Pinterest is great because there are tons of people who pin stuff on Pinterest that are just cool looking characters, cool looking uh, art, concept art that fits in the fantasy world, maps that they've drawn or examples of how to do, do how to make your own maps. It can be a little overwhelming, but once you've got that kind of kernel of what you're gonna do in your campaign and you need a little something to add into it, like I was, uh, when I was running the Flex campaign, I would need inspiration for a new character. And I would just flip through some character images on Pinterest and I'd be like, oh, little boy who looks emaciated. Got it. I'm going to use him. Big guy who's got an eye patch and, you know, tattoos on one side of his face. I'm going to use him. Right. I used to fear stealing from people. That is so hobbling in D&D. &D. You have to be perfectly willing to steal anything from anywhere and not get too caught up about it. Because what you're doing is you're making fun for your friends. Right. If your friends recognize that you're stealing H.P. Lovecraft, great. If they recognize, oh, is that some episode of uh, Game of Thrones? That's awesome. They're going to love it mm -hmm. uh, because they'll, they'll have the recognition and... and and if they don't, that's fine. They'll think you're a genius. Right, exactly. <laughs> I was listening to some uh, somebody, and it may have been Chris Perkins. I always think it's Chris Perkins. <laughs> I, I think everything good is Chris Perkins. But um, And it was just steal everything. Don't worry about it. Steal everything. You're just going to have fun and all that. And then the kind of the complete opposite of that, which I'm almost positive was Chris Perkins, is don't be afraid to use your ideas. Don't horde like oh this is a really good one i'm gonna i'm gonna save that one for like when it's a a really special game or something don't hoard your ideas in and like this this you know special you know reserve <laughs> idea list that you're never gonna actually use use them you will come up with new stuff you will don't be afraid that like oh that's my good stuff uh i'm never gonna have more than that and it's it's done you just use it you'll you will be, continue to be creative you will come up with new stuff the uh, more you use it the more it'll help you come up right. with more stuff. And I learned that running the Flex game. 
every week I had to come up with essentially an episode of a TV show. Mm -hmm. First and second act, you guys will figure out the third act. And I didn't have time to dilly-dally and, and try to come up with great ideas. It was just like, let's get something, something in front of you guys that you can work with. And doing that, just forcing yourself as a DM to come up with content constantly, that trains your brain to be able to... Don't be afraid. Yeah. There's so many things to be afraid of, you know. <laughs> to, to be afraid to change pre-done pre content. Be a, don't be afraid to, to steal stuff. Be afraid to use your... You're good ideas. You, you'll have more. Uh, just don't don't be afraid. But to wrap it up, you know the the general prep, casting, materials, like miniatures and props, things like that. Uh, the reference material, the pronunciation guide. If you if maybe not everybody has that kind of issue. I do. It's like you do too. Yeah, I do. Uh, um, encounters. It doesn't have to be game master. It can be any whatever tool you use. Yeah. It could be index cards, right? I really like game master too. It's very versatile and it has a very low physical footprint on your space, um, it, it adds a lot more than you know, index cards do for me, so I think it's fantastic as well. Uh, for the pre-built stuff, you know, read it, don't feel like you have to memorize everything, don't feel like you have to stick to it, feel free to change it, just, yeah. that's okay. They don't, don't be afraid of not knowing as much as your players do when it comes yeah. to the canon. For the prep process for homebrew, you know more than I do, yeah, it's, it's start with the conflict and start with some sort of seed, something that inspires you to write an interesting conflict. And then make sure that they're interesting both objectives and obstacles. Just as much in the pre-built, when you're doing your own thing, don't be afraid to steal. Because yes. whatever's in your head came from somewhere, you're already stealing. Yeah, don't even know it. Don't even know it. <laughs> You're already a terrible person, so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to to use the good stuff, your good ideas, right? You, yeah. You'll come up with more. You, you don't have a finite of awesome in your head. It's, it's going to replenish, so don't worry about that. Uh, and just don't be afraid in general, right? Don't be yeah. afraid of your players. Don't be afraid of their perception. You're all here there to have fun. Uh, so have fun. It's okay. That's it for this episode. We've got a number of different topics that we will potentially be doing our next episode on, but we would like other people to tell us what they would like to hear about. One of the next topics we're interested in doing is D&D &D Beyond, which is a new website that Wizards of the Coast launched. Two months ago? Um, Roughly, was I it? can't remember now. Um, I actually have notes on the whole thing, but uh, yeah, sometime in the last year, they started a beta, mm -hmm. and they just extended the beta to two additional phases. They just released those phases. They're, so I'm sorry, yeah. Conceptually, the full product, uh, not all of the different pieces are there, but we've been using it. It's got a lot of problems. We're looking at it, and we would love to talk about it. Um, another topic would be celebrities that are kind of D&D, &D, uh, I don't want to say based, but known for D&D &D or known in the D&D &D community. Yeah, um, it's, it's something that's kind of a, a new thing in D&D &D over the last maybe decade. We have people who are well known, and aren't just the people who made D and D. Right. The, yes. <laughs> not just people who made a bunch of money off of it. Not that they're not making much money off of it, but um, known for playing it, not just making it. Right. Yeah. But could be known for making it as well. Um, just something that is kind of unheard of. You know, six yeah. years ago, five years ago. One of our other topics: anatomy of an encounter, which is probably pretty. Um, targeted to the DMs in the audience. Um, how to build an encounter, what it should look like, and how do you run it. So again, tell us if one of those or some other topic is interesting to you. You can leave a comment on what you want to see. Yeah. Uh, you can reach out to us what you want to see. Use the new website, dungeonsandtangents.net, um, and let us know. Uh, feel free to subscribe on whichever venue you like, uh, Google Play, iTunes, RSS feed, things like that. Or YouTube. Or YouTube, right, right here on YouTube. Uh, also leave comments there. Uh, but that's all for this episode. Yeah, thanks for watching.